Hello, hello, hello. This is Truth Be Told. This is Dr. Walter Aka. And many oh. people, many people will know. Kyle, let me introduce you. Many, Please. Many people Please. will know uh, my my old co-host, the man of the hour, Dr. <laughs> Kyle Dumpert. He is actually coming on today to grace us with uh, an awesome presentation. Uh, you know, he told me that he didn't want to tell me. And I said, don't tell me, surprise me. So he's going to do a, a, a lecture. He's been lecturing with, um, is it the um, Pennsylvania Dental Association? You are making it sound so much better than what it actually is. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I like how you say I'm going to grace you with the presence of my lecture where it one, it's not a lecture, um, but I appreciate case presentations. Okay. Uh, but um, and Grace, uh, we'll we'll get we'll see what you think about that after the presentation. If yeah, you it's really all good, do, I'm excited. So so we're all going we're all going to learn together. I have never I have never seen this presentation, so he's going to go ahead and go from here. So Dr. Dumper, please let us begin. All right. So this is just a shout out to. Uh, Academy of General Dentistry and more specifically Pennsylvania Academy of General Dentistry. We put these together. We have a spring and a fall meeting. Uh, what we learn at the previous meeting, we go back to our practice and uh, we implement what we've learned in an effort to learn from each other. So we put these presentations together based on what we learned at the previous, document it, take some pictures, present it to each other at the, the next um, CE event. And uh, like I said, that way we, we can learn from each other. Uh, and this is actually the, the best day of learning because you get to see what, what worked, what didn't work, how people were tweaking it to, for their own practice and own patients. So um, this is something that a lot of dentists in Pennsylvania uh, with our um, master track, we have track set up that uh, if you want to get your mastership through the Academy of General Dentistry, if you participate for five years, do these presentations, it doubles your, your continuing education credits from lecture hours to hands-on hours. But um, this is just a, a glimpse of what those presentations are. So uh, these presentations are based on lectures that we had in Philadelphia in the spring of 2023, where uh, one of the speakers, Dr. Kaczynski, he uh, talks about he, he's associated with Han implants through Glidewell. So he gave a presentation on uh, implants and the Han implant specifically. Uh, so these are the presentations on that. So we'll start off with um, a 56 year old female who has had an extensive dental history uh, diagnosed with trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, she had come to my practice after having all of this dentistry done. So start off with her uh, existing pan implants. All of the root canals were placed uh, prior to her coming to the office along with most of the crown and bridge. Um, actually had to replace some of the existing anterior crown work for her. Uh, she had an implant at number 27 that had uh, failed, wasn't able to be retreated. So I did an immediate implant on number 27. So I'll, I'll claim the implant on 27. Um, but she was starting to have some issues with tooth number 14. Uh, she had a uh, draining sinus tract on the distal. I sent her to the endodontist for uh, evaluation to see if he thought a, a potential retreat would help her out, fix the problem. Uh, he recommended against it. He thought it was more of a perio issue with the bone loss from the frication, as you can see in the pan. Um, so ultimately decided she needed to have the tooth out. Uh, she does have a trigger point for trigeminal neuralgia on the, the top left with cold air, cold wind. Um, so that was a concern plus the proximity to the sinus. So I ended up taking the tooth out. Uh, best way I, I do that is I section the, the top of the tooth off and then I separate the roots individually, take them out one at a time with luxators. Um, I have a couple of different bone grafts I use, but um, primarily I use an osteogen plug graft, which I'm 
curious to hear Walter's opinion on those. Um, but got the tooth out, put the osteogen plug graft in, sutured it up, let her heal for three months. Uh, when she came back, got a comb beam on her to evaluate how much bone was in the area. As you can see, there was not enough bone to stay out of the sinus. I was planning on putting a five by eight Han implant in to do that. I was going to have to go into her sinus a little bit. The, uh, since I don't do lateral sinus lifts, the, and I don't do the traditional, uh, crestal approach sinus lift. I had taken a class on the Densa Versaber and sorry, dog is upset. I uh, took a class on a Versa Densaber and they have a really nice technique for a single implant sinus bump into the, into the sinus to be able to place your implant at the same time. For those not familiar, it's a, the sinus, um, doing the sinus bump with the Densa Versabers, the drill runs in reverse and instead of drilling out for the osteobiotomy, it compacts the bone and you can get a three millimeter sinus bump without adding any uh, extra bone to it. Um, if you want to add bone, you can get a lot larger bump, but uh, this also works great for the posterior maxilla, even if you're not doing a sinus bump because it condenses that bone and gives you, takes it from that styrofoam type bone to more of a hardwood style bone uh, to give you a lot better stability with your implant. So did a three millimeter sinus lift. I did add a little bit of 30, 70 cortico cancellous bone um, with the, um, to check stability. I used a little penguin. It's a radio frequency peg that you attach to the implant gives, gave me a reading of 32, which is pretty low um, stability quotient, which is to be expected because of the, the quality of bone in the posterior maxilla and uh, with going up into the sinus. When it was time for her to be restored, I got the reading again. So I went from a 32 to a 69. So that gave me the confidence that I did in fact get some healing and uh, I have a pretty stable implant. Uh, that is the day I put the implant in. This is the day uh, three months later after healing took place. I think I uh, four months, sorry, with this one. I waited an extra month. Uh, much to Walter, Dr. Aka's dismay, I put a healing cap on right away instead of buried it. And uh, I ended up getting pretty good healing with the without burying it. I don't like to put my patients through a second stage surgery if I can help it. Um, that will come back to bite me on one of these other presentations that I'll show. But that is the case restored. Uh, the trigeminal neuralgia didn't have any effect. I didn't cause any, uh, didn't exacerbate the issue for her at all. And she is happy to have that implant restored. Uh, yes, there's a periapical radiolucency associated with number 13. We're keeping an eye on that. The endodontist already evaluated that. So if that is something that continues to change in the future, she may end up with yet another implant. Second case, we have a uh, pretty much the worst patient you could attempt this on, but she's an 89-year-old female, history of heart attack, but not within the past six months. Uh, she was does have congestive heart failure. She's on oxygen, obese, very cranky, just all around not a very pleasant person. Um, but she came in with a fractured number six with a previous root canal. Uh, the plan was to... Uh, because there was no feral effect that I could get on the root and she had a neighboring implant where, so I didn't want to do crown lengthening to, uh, restore the tooth. The best option was to extract the tooth, do an immediate implant. Uh, I decided on a four, seven by 13 Zimmer implant. Uh, I was going to simultaneously graft with a cortico cancellous graft, uh, made her an Essex as a temporary and, uh, got a 3D cone beam scan and intraoral scan had a guide made so I could get the implant right where I wanted it. 
So this is how she presented, fractured off. Um, the comb beam that I got, digitally planned the surgery, sent this to the lab with the intraoral scan, had a guide made. I have the Zimmer's new C3D fully guided kit, so there's no keys involved. It um, controls your, your depth and um, your angulation, so really just once the tooth is out, just put the, dirt, put the guide on and drill exactly to where the depth is supposed to go. Got the implant in. This is where, uh, again, I put the healing abutment on. Uh, I got really good stability with the implant once it was placed. You can see the Essex retainer in with the, the Ponic, uh, composite Ponic in. Uh, she went for about four weeks before she came back for a cleaning and said, hey, something feels loose up there. Uh, so I checked her out. The healing abutment was actually pretty loose. Um, I took that off, put the cover screw on, let her uh, let that heal up, and was hoping that not too dam too much damage was going on. I thought maybe I just didn't tighten the, the healing abutment down the whole way. Um, she later returned. Uh, with a fractured Essex retainer, made her a new one. And three months after the implant was in, what I found out was she didn't listen to my instructions. So she was not taking the Essex out to eat. She was leaving it in and just eating with it in. My panic on the Essex was hitting into the abutment and that ultimately caused the implant not to integrate. Um, so unfortunately I had to take the implant out. I grafted with a 30, 70 cortico cancellous, um, Raptos, uh, bone graft from Glidewell. And as you can see, uh, I did not achieve very much thickness in her bone whenever healing after the graft, after the implant came out. So again, I grabbed the VersaBurrs because you can do a ridge expansion with those. I figured that was my best chance. We were six months, six to nine months in at this point. She hates wearing Essex retainer, is getting crankier every time I see her. Um, she finally learned not to eat with the Essex in, and she did take responsibility for the implant failing. She also said that the other implants that she had in that area had also mm -hmm. failed initially and had to have um, grafted and go back and put new implants in by the oral surgeon. She let me know that after my mishap with her implants. Anyway, uh, used the uh, VersaBurrs again. I was able to get ridge expansion. This time I was only able to get a 3.5 implant in, 13 length. And, uh, again, I put the cover screw on, but I was, the, I placed the implant a lot, uh, more subcrestal this time. So I made sure she wasn't able to hit it, stressed to her again, don't eat with your Essex in, um, because it wasn't guided. Uh, I didn't have the angulation that I wanted, uh, but I was ultimately able to restore it with a cement retained crown. I'm not happy with the bone loss that I do have around the implant, but she is 89 years old and she's not going to be around forever. So I figure I just need this thing to last at most five to 10 years. Um, unfortunately, that was just a uh, complication of the type of patient she is. Again, complicated medical history. So I, I'm happy I was able to get something in. With missing, uh, the she has a, a cantilevered ponic off the other implant bridge, so I did lose some gingiva in that area. However, as you can see, she has a very low smile line, and um, she also has a fracture of the porcelain there from the amount of force that she was putting on her teeth, but she's happy she doesn't have to wear the Essex anymore. She has a tooth in there, and it is doing well. 
Uh, well, no. how, how, how many of these do you want me to present? Th those two are perfectly fine. Okay. All right. We, we want to save some for, uh, for people to listen to later on. Sure. Sure. Yeah, so, so what we'll do is we'll exit out of this and then yep. can I ask That's you some scary. questions? Yeah. So, okay. So first off, right. Um, you were looking in that area, uh, number 14, the first case you talked about extraction, uh, and implant placement, you did a sinus lift. The one thing that I want to say is you did a crestal because you said, oh, I'm not trained in crestal. I, I, I didn't do it the traditional way. Of right. Right. The, but you're still yeah. you still right. pretty much did a crestal uh, uh, sinus augmentation. And yeah. so I want you to remember that. Uh, and then two, you know, putting the bone in there. I normally if I'm doing a crestal, I add bone. I'm going to say 90 percent of the time. OK. You know, and so that's something that I do just to kind of give myself that. And I'm not doing it just because I want barely enough bone around. I want a lot of bone around my implant because we know that we get resorption. When right. patients are healing, we get resorption. So that's why I add a, an abundant amount of bone. So that okay. one would have been like maybe like 0.5 cc's of um, whatever cancellous mixture bone that you did. You did 70, 30. That's great. You right. know what I mean? You want to make sure that you get that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Another thing was um, the ISQ. Can you explain the ISQ to people? And I, I looked at the range and it had like 70 plus is great. 60 to 69 is median and then 59 and under uh, is, is kind of questionable. Right. So radio frequency, it's a um, it's about the size of a large pen. Uh, you put a <coughs> excuse me. You put a little uh, specialized peg um, screwed into the implant. The uh, that peg uh, is tuned into the, the radio frequency that the, the pen shoots out of the tip. But basically, you hold the tip of the pen close to the, the peg. Once you put it in the implant, it shoots out a radio frequency, vibrates at a certain range, bounces back, gives you a reading, the ISQ, implant stability quotient, and tells you, gives you a, a reading. Um, a one-time reading is okay. Um, I use it more as this is what it is the day of placement. This is what it is the day I want to restore it. If that number on the day I go to restore has improved, gotten larger. So in this case, it went from uh, high 30s to high 60s. I got almost a, a doubling effect of... Um, how stable that implant was that made me feel comfortable enough to restore that implant. Had it gone from 39 to say 50, <coughs> I probably would have waited uh, another month or two before trying to um, torque a, a crown down on top of that implant. So because I was in that high 60, low 70 range, that made me more comfortable that the implant had healed to the point where I was comfortable restoring it. And I'm actually going to show, I'm going to show a video that basically shows exactly what you did, if you don't mind. It's a quick, like, sure. one-minute uh, video. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen so I can show this for you guys. And, I mean, again, I don't, we, we can, you can talk me through this while it's happening versus me playing the audio. <laughs> yeah. So this, this unit looks a little bit more, uh, a little different than what I have, but basic same idea. So you have a pin um, that screws into the implant. You order them specific for whatever implant you're placing, size, brand. Once you hand tighten that into the implant, you have the tip of the instrument. You hold it close. It shoots out a, a radio frequency that, <coughs> excuse me, vibrates. Uh, that peg, it provides feedback as far as how stable that is, um, gives you a reading, and um, that way you have a quantifiable measurement of if that implant stability has changed over time uh, versus torque testing your implants and putting some torque on it. Your implant's loose. Now you got to come out. Now it's got to come out and start from zero. This, if you get a low reading, Put the healing cap back on, let it heal for another month or two, check it again, and you could say potentially save yourself from you know, causing an implant to not integrate fully by unintentionally backing it out.
And I have a question. Now, when it comes to this, like, are we saying that because you have a high, um, you know, uh, uh, I, ISQ number, all of a sudden you're going to, what, not, the implant's not going to fail later on? Or is it just saying that, hey, the implant is osteointegrated enough where you should be more confident in restoring it? Uh, more confident in restoring it. it it's osteointegrated enough. Um, whether, you know, if you get a high torque value, say you torque an implant in at 60 nanometers a centimeter uh, whenever you first put the implant in. And so you're going to have a high reading on that. You're going to be in your the 70s, 80s with your ISQ number. You, if you over torque to that implant, putting it in and you go to restore it and the ISQ, all of a sudden it dropped down to 40 and you thought, oh, I had this real stable implant to begin with. Um, that gives you an idea like uh, this implant probably didn't integrate the way I wanted it to. Um, so instead of restoring it, maybe I should consider taking it out so I don't have a problem in the future. Maybe I'd, I save myself a $500 lab bill um, by checking it before I go to restore it. Or with the case that I presented, I had this you know, low quality bone into the sinus not a great ISQ reading to begin with. It jumped up to almost 70. I feel a lot more comfortable restoring it at this point because I got such a big improvement in my ISQ reading. And I wonder if because I wonder if um, your ISQ number was not high. Like you said, you said the quality of bone, the further back, more and uh, posterior maxillary, the bone bone density is not as much but right. i wonder if the sinus being near the sinus also has something to do with it right versus letting right. it heal and then you have now bone formation around your implant so now you have more stability right yep right so yeah but no that was that was great man like we definitely went through a good case um i i appreciate you using the I, isq um because of the fact that it gives you a, a definitive number for you to re uh, reference with right? right and there's a lot of times where you know patients would be like well why did my implant fail you can go back to your numbers and say based on everything that we know which is a universal accepted uh way of measuring stability it should have worked or it shouldn't have failed but there's other factors that go into it but at least you can right. eliminate one factor which is i'm not sure if it actually osteointegrated or if it was stable enough at the beginning you know right Right. So yeah, man, but thank you, man. I really appreciate it. I, 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 you know, one thing that I like about you, Kyle, is you're very honest, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not everybody would have shown a failed, you know, fail case. They right. would show all the beautiful ones that always work and implants always work and stuff like that. And, and I definitely appreciate you for being so uh, transparent and open to say, Hey, this didn't work out. This is what it looks like. I thought actually you got a really good uh, end resort uh, because of the fact that you were you had a lot of factors. You were dealing with um, an area that had probably had multiple uh, surgeries. So we had scar tissue and everything that you had to right. deal with as well. You know, um, the one thing that I would have done, I guess, would have been to do a bigger ridge augmentation. When the first time it failed, I would have just done a bigger uh, augmentation so that I wouldn't have to deal with this uh, patient again. <laughs> you right, know? right. And then, then, like you said, the versaburs, I love the versaburs, uh, you know, because of the fact that, you know, osteodensification is what they call it by spinning it backwards, it pushes some of that bone and, and, uh, condenses everything so that we get stronger, um, dense bone around our implants. So that I definitely enjoy it. And there are, they're not the only ones to do this, but there are people out there that, We'll argue that we're not here to argue that we're basically here to to educate and then and kind of show. But I really definitely appreciate your honesty, man. I thought it was a great two excellent cases. If you want to come back on and do more, I will be more than happy to have you. And if you want to come back on and, you know, help uh, co-host once in a while. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and yeah. honestly, um, most of the lectures that I learn from the most aren't the ones where the guys are getting or the girls are getting up there showing their best cases. It's this is where something went wrong. This is where I failed. So when I do these uh, presentations, um, I usually like to pick out some of my failures and some of my, uh, so you don't think I'm an idiot, show some of my successes <laughs> also. Uh, and I, I feel like that allows people to learn a lot more from each other. Absolutely. And that's how it should be. But, you know, we're, we're very uh, cocky as a dentist to think yeah. that, you know, we can only show the excellence. And I've shown patients, I'm like, look, this didn't work out this failed this and I sh I'll show everything. I don't care. 
But well, you know what I mean? Maybe I'm just not as cocky or confident as I should be. I don't know. But uh anybody that knows me knows I am pretty cocky. So let me know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let me not lie. You know what I mean? But yeah, man, I honestly definitely appreciate you, man. Yeah, absolutely. It's fun doing this again and look forward to the next one. Yeah, man. And I actually will give a little teaser. You're going to be coming on uh, soon. We don't want to tell you when, but you're going to be giving us a little rundown on um, your experience as a, as a, a, a rural dentist and some yep. of the things that people talk about and yep. what you see in some of the struggles that you've gone through. Yep. That, that should be a good conversation. Yeah, man. All right.